Welcome, uh, people. We're uh, waiting for people to join the room, uh, and we'll get started uh, in in about a minute. Thanks uh, for everybody joining today. We're going to have a really exciting, very exciting conversation. Thanks everybody for joining. People are still entering the chat and uh, we'll get started in about a minute. This is uh, Jeff Sachs here. Thank you for joining today. We'll get started in just a few seconds now. Thank you very much, everybody, but we'll let people uh, join the call, uh, connect, uh, and uh, then we'll get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. I'm Jeffrey Sachs. Welcome to Book Club with Jeffrey Sachs. And today I'm absolutely thrilled to be in discussion with Keisha Lane, Associate Professor of History at the University of Pittsburgh and President of the African American Intellectual History Society. And Keisha, thank you so much for uh, being together. We're here to discuss your wonderful important new book, Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America. So welcome. Uh, looking forward very much to our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about the origins of the book? Uh, I would suspect, actually, though all of us should know Fannie Lou Hamer, I'm rather sure that many of, of the people joining do not know Fannie Lou Hamer or maybe know the name, but could not place the name. Uh, you've written a, a wonderful account of her leadership uh, and her life, and um, we need to know Fannie Lou Hamer. So maybe you could describe uh, at the outset who she is and, and why you wrote the book. Absolutely. Fannie Lou Hamer uh, was a civil rights activist. Uh, she was also a human rights activist. Uh, one of the things that I would emphasize is that when we think about Black political rights uh, in the United States, uh, we have to think about the crucial work of someone like Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, who really, I think, uh, spoke out uh, about the injustices that Black people face and particularly spoke out against uh, voter suppression. Fannie Lou Hamer uh, was a disabled um, black woman from Mississippi. She was born uh, in 1917. She was the youngest of 20 children, grew up uh, as a sharecropper. Uh, and, and I think all of these aspects of her life uh, really help us to understand how she developed uh, into this fearless um, activist uh, who committed herself to improving the lives of black people, certainly, but really committed herself to improving the lives of, of all Americans. Uh, and so she is someone that I that I think every American needs to know um, and you know about and, and I'm thrilled to have written this book, which, as you point out, centers her life, but also gives us a, a good sense of her ideas. Keisha, I, I, I wanted to play a little snippet uh, of a famous uh, episode. It's a really a pivotal moment in America. Uh, I'll play it and then I will be grateful if you would 
describe the historical context. You're our historian here. Uh, and this was really a central moment, but I'd like people to, to see Fannie Lou Hamer uh, and uh, to hear her voice because it's, even though this is just a tiny snippet, it's, it's very powerful. So if I can uh, do the tech right and uh, share my screen properly uh, and, oh my, that is strange. I don't see my, the part that I want to play, but uh, I'm going to find it. It's somehow not showing up. Hmm. Well, I don't know if, uh, I don't think I have my screen shared uh, appropriately. And when I try, I don't see what I need to see. Oh, here we go. Okay, uh, can you see that uh, on the screen? Yeah. Okay, so I hope everybody can see and hear. This is a, a moment uh, that uh, Keisha will uh, describe for us uh, in detail, but it is at the 1964 Democratic Party nominated convention when Lyndon Johnson was to be nominated uh, as candidate for president in, in the 1964 elections. And there was a battle over who would represent Mississippi. And Fannie Lou Hamer is this remarkable activist came to the convention and said, we, the real people of Mississippi, not uh, the white supremacists should be the one to represent Mississippi. So we just have a, a few seconds of clip, but you can see the, the power of, of this person in her remarks. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, it was the 31st of August in 1962 that 18 of us traveled 26 miles to the county courthouse in Indianola to try to register to become first class citizens. We was met in Indianola with, by policemen. The president. So Keisha, this is uh, an iconic moment of American history. Uh, this woman that nobody in the nation uh, knew before showed up at the Democratic Convention uh, because she had started a, a party in Mississippi uh, in which uh, African Americans would be represented and have the right to vote. She had struggled with incredible bravery, as you'll describe for us, to get that right to vote. And uh, I, it's just mesmerizing to watch her in the committee, no notes, you might imagine the first time ever for, for her in a situation like this, she'd be trying to read and shaking and nervous, but she's mm -hmm. sitting there. I come from Rueville, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. This is my street address. And I am here because I represent the people of, of uh, Mississippi. And uh, tell us about this moment, please. Uh, well, this is, as you point out, uh, such a pivotal moment uh, you know, and in fact, there's several things that, that I would emphasize just because as I was listening to it again and, and watching it, I, I could only think about the fact that two years prior, uh, Fannie Lou Hamer was uh, pretty much uh, in Ruleville, Mississippi, working on the plantation, uh, you know, as a sharecropper. She was not someone who I think many people imagined would find herself uh, in August 1964, giving this powerful speech. Um, and when she's at this convention, she's talking about the moment in August 1962 when she attempts to register to vote. It's important for people to know that this was the first time that she joined the movement. It was in August 1962 that Fannie Lou Hamer um, attended a mass meeting in which she learned, according to Hamer, for the first time she learned about the right her constitutional right to vote as a citizen of the United States. She was it's, a, it's amazing. Uh, sorry to, in, yeah, in, uh, yeah. to interject, but you know, she says she she didn't know whether to go to the meeting. She said no, then right. she decided to go. And then she says, I didn't know that I had a right yeah. to vote. It opened yeah. her eyes. It's really an, an amazing. It's it's so true and uh, so powerful. It is, um, you know, and I think a lot of people might 
reflect on this in, in this current moment and, and say to themselves, how is that possible? Uh, but, but I think the answer lies in really understanding the Jim Crow South in particular. It, it, it lies in understanding all of the strategies that white supremacists were employing to keep black people from the ballot box. Uh, so we know about things like literacy tests, uh, which of course Hamer uh, experienced. She, she spoke about what that was like. We know uh, about the violence uh, and an attempt to keep people from voting. Uh, and the other strategy too uh, is limiting access to information, making sure that people did not have, um, you know, access to the kind of information that would empower them uh, just the way that it empowered Fannie Lou Hamer. And so when she learned uh, in this mass meeting about her right to vote as a citizen of the United States, she couldn't believe it. And she was so moved, she decided that she would join the movement immediately. She became a field secretary. And this is for you know, the Student Nonviolence Coordinating Committee. Um, and it became a way for her to ultimately play a role uh, in, in expanding Black political rights. One of the things that she decided, she decided that if she did not know about these rights, at the age of 44 in Mississippi, she knew that that meant many other people did not know about these rights. Right and so part of her effort was to get that information out to so um, a broader public. Excuse me, Samantha, please, uh, please mute your phone. Everybody mute the phone, please. I'm so sorry, Keisha, and to everybody. Please. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I think this point is important. So, so here you have a person who joins the movement at the age of 44. Some would argue that she's late to the game, right? Some would, would, would say uh, that, you know, when, when you're 44 years old, joining a movement of which most of the people you're actually collaborating with are much younger than you, many of them are college students, one might think that she would be uncomfortable in, state, you know, in the space, that, that she would be nervous about collaborating with, with these folks, or, or maybe she, she might feel um, you know, a kind of way, uh, given the fact that she's much older uh, and she had to listen to them and, and learn from them. But Fannie Hamer was someone who, um, I think uh, you know, she was powerful, she, she was humble too. And she had this, uh, this approach that she could learn from anyone. Um, and once she obtained the information that she obtained in that meeting, uh, she set out to let the whole world know. Um, and, uh, you know, the road to August 1964 was a rocky one. Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, in August of 1962, attempts to register to vote for the first time. She uh, is stopped. Uh, she talks about the encounters with police. She talks about the literacy test. Uh, this is a Black woman who had a sixth grade education, and she was being asked uh, very specific questions about the Constitution, about the state Constitution, of all things, um, and she did not know the answers. Uh, but again, this was a strategy to, to block her and to block others uh, from voting, yet she persisted. Something like 5% of uh, the African American mm -hmm. population was registered or, or even yes. less. I mean, th this was yes. uh, absolutely uh, an, an unbelievable apartheid system uh, that was uh, used every means, as you said, every trickery, every mm -hmm. amount of violence, uh, every amount of disempowerment to make sure that someone like Fannie Lou Hamer would not show up to register. It, it makes it so amazing. And just to repeat uh, what you said, but I want to underscore it. She's, she's the 20th child of a sharecropping mm -hmm. family, grows up in incredible poverty, yeah. uh, We'll talk later on uh, about all of the abuses and uh, mm -hmm. polio victim as a as a as a young girl. Nothing stops this woman. She learns she has the right to vote. It says, and just with the the most straightforward, direct honesty. Okay, I have a right. I'm going to get that right. I'm a human being. That's it. Not more exactly. complicated than that. Exactly. Um, and, and it was something that I think, you know, Hamer talks about this moment as both a political awakening, but also as a religious awakening. Uh, you know, one of the things that I emphasize in the book is that she was a person of faith. And she believed 
that it was God's will for her to, to join the movement. She be believed that it was part of her calling to be part of this effort uh, to, to shed the light on exactly all that you're pointing out, you know, to, so that people would be aware of what was happening, uh, particularly in the state of Mississippi, which was, which was not uh, different than what was happening in other parts of the South. Uh, and, and Hamer, I think one of the things that she, you know, resisted immediately was this notion that only certain people should have a voice and only certain people uh, should be able to, to, to serve in political office. And here is where she bumped up against uh, the, the Democratic Party in the state of Mississippi, a party that, as you point out, uh, they were completely fine with, with having a state with an estimated 450,000 Black people um, and yet only 5% actually registered to vote. They were okay with that. Um, and they were okay with having an all white party that would in fact represent the state. They were okay with, with not having the voices of so many residents from Mississippi uh, the, you know, heard and represented. Uh, and Fannie Lou Hamer uh, joined forces with, with a number of activists uh, to establish the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which was a direct um, counter a, a direct, uh, you know, in direct opposition to the state uh, Democratic Party, um, and and they were making a case that you you cannot, you absolutely cannot have a democracy. And again, she was going right back to to thinking about the Constitution and the core ideals. Uh, and she said you cannot have a democracy and yet not have full representation. You know, what is we the what what does we the people actually mean? If you have thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, um, you know, not heard, not represented. And so the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, as you point out, uh, they traveled from Mississippi to Atlantic City in August 1962, uh, which gets us to this moment where Hamer gives the speech. Um, and, and as you noted, they were there because they insisted that they should be seated uh, instead of the all white Democratic Party um, of the state of Mississippi, because they wanted to send a message that certainly on the national level, no one should accept any kind of representation that excluded um, a, a large segment, right, of the, of the, of the state population. Uh, this speech that she gave electrified the nation. It's in fact the speech that catapulted her political career. Um, as you pointed out, no one knew about Mrs. Hamer until she gave the speech. And in the speech, she talks about voter suppression. She talks about the violence. She talks about the difficulties that she endured. And she talks about uh, state sanctioned violence. She talks about all of these ways, you know, all the ways that Black people in Mississippi are, are being blocked. Um, and she makes a demand uh, that ultimately, if in fact the Democratic Party on the national level, if they are in fact committed to this notion of upholding a democracy, if in fact they are committed uh, to equal representation, which of course, you know, they weren't. They, they weren't. <laughs> I mean, just to be straight up, they weren't. Uh, but but she was saying, you know, show, um, t you know, tell us what you really think. You know, tell us where your commitments. Show us where your commitments really lie in making the decision. Uh, and so, what did they offer her? They offered her two symbolic seats. Um, Before so, we get there, Keisha, mm -hmm. I wanted to uh, mm -hmm. note. Uh, something that I didn't know uh, as I was, after reading your book, went to look at these clips, which I would encourage people to do online. Uh, it turns out one of the reasons why that uh, is such a short segment is that the national networks cut away from her remarks as she started these incredibly powerful remarks because Lyndon Johnson <laughs> pulled <laughs> a typical Johnson maneuver. Mm -hmm. He did not want Americans to see her on national broadcast television. So he called an impromptu news conference that moment. And as she's just warming up to describe how the police pull them over for trying to register to vote, mm -hmm. they say, oh, we have to cut away. Uh, we have a word from Washington. <laughs> and there's Lyndon Johnson. And uh, he, he babbles for a couple of minutes. Everyone's amazed. There's no reason for press conference, no nothing. But by the time they go back to the Democratic Party convention, she's finished. But then they play it that evening, I guess, on the news. 
Exactly. Um, and so his strategy did not work. I mean, and, and, and I think it's important for us to, to really reflect on this. Think about what it means for the president of the United States um, to be ultimately intimidated by this black woman, sharecropper, um, who's there to simply, you know, she's telling her testimony. She's sharing what she has gone through. But the irony is that, uh, you know, he understood, I think, the power behind that testimony. He understood how it could, in fact, change, you know, hearts and minds. He understood how it, it could, in fact, also embarrass um, the Democratic Party, that, that it could allow people to see how Black people, in this case, were being treated as second-class citizens. Uh, and, you know, it is really telling because in the process of writing the book, what I found so in, intriguing is I would pull all of these, uh, you know, I would talk, I, I would look for how people would, you know, describe the Democratic National Convention and in particular those who were there. So, you know, even um, I remember just reading all of these um, newspaper articles or even archival material of people who were, who were at the convention without fail, every single person would talk about Fannie Lou Hamer. Exactly. It was, yeah, it was as if nothing else happened. You know, I almost, I remember chuckling and thinking, well, there were other people speaking there too. Like other things happened at this convention, but. And interestingly, by the way, Martin Luther <laughs> King spoke before her, but. No one but, remembers. And, and he, you know, he spoke, he spoke well as he always did, but she spoke so powerfully. And I love exactly. hands clasped, not <laughs> fidgeting at all and looking straight ahead and all those white faces in the room amazed <laughs> who is this person and uh, you know what she talks about also is is astounding two basic stories one mm -hmm. is of this occasion of trying to vote and then coming back to the plantation and mm -hmm. the other is this terrible incident when she's beaten and i wonder whether you could describe uh, both of those because they they are riveting, but they are also so emblematic about the United States of America in 1964. Absolutely. And so to the first point about the experience of returning um, home after trying to register to vote and coming back to the plantation, um, one of the most difficult things that Hamer uh, deals with in this particular context is when she returns, the white landowner says to her, you need, I'm giving you an ultimatum, essentially, you need to uh, withdraw your registration or you need to leave the plantation. Uh, it's important for people to understand that, you know, we, we, we were talking about Hamer living in poverty. She was a sharecropper. Um, she, at the time, was married and her, her husband was also working as a sharecropper on the plantation. They were already struggling to make ends meet. So having, essentially, your employer say to you, um, your involvement in, in this effort for, for voting rights uh, means that you're going to have to choose. You're going to have to choose. Uh, either you're going to do this or you're going to be able to uh, sustain yourself and, and be able to uh, take care of your family. And, um, and Hamer made a very difficult decision. She walked away um, and said, okay, fine, then I'll leave. And, and, um, and in fact, what she yeah. said to this man, which was incredible, Mm -hmm. Her whole livelihood, her family depended on it, everything. Right. She looked at him after returning, after the police intervention, she looked mm -hmm. at him and said, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing right. it for me because Absolutely. I'm a person. Unbelievable. So the, the guts is just incredible. The straightforwardness is such is. a gift. The bravery is, is Time, it's, it's amazing, actually. It is. And it ties back to her early life, too. I mean, I think, you know, I hope people will, will read the book in which I talk about, you know, her, her mother. And, you know, and so I, when you talk about her bravery and I think immediately about her own mother and, and so all of these lessons, you know, growing up in a family of people who, um, you know, were struggling to make ends meet, uh, but they understood they understood that they needed to speak up, that they needed to uh, assert themselves at certain moments. Um, because, you know, you know, I think like all of these lessons made a difference for Hamer and, and, and it shaped her as, as a person. So 
when she has this encounter, you know, as you point, as you point out, it's a dangerous thing to do. You know, this is a, a moment where, um, you know, in Mississippi, but, but also true across the South, you know, there's just a wave of violence when it comes to lynchings in particular. Hamer being able to stand up to the white landowner and say, you know, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me was a very bold move. Uh, and, and she paid the price. You know, she walked away from the plantation, not surprisingly, you know, in, in, it really in only a matter of weeks. Um, her husband was, was thrown off too, right? And so it, it led to a lot of financial instability on top of the difficulties that she was facing. But there is a, a point where later in life, and I always reflect on this, Hamer, ref, you know, she's talking about that painful experience. She's talking about being kicked off the plantation. And she said that when she looked back, she realized that it was the most empowering moment because it set her free. And she said, so here you have a landowner saying to her, listen, you either, you know, you, you either walk away from this, from this movement, um, you know, or you ultimately face the risk of not having a job. And she said, what he didn't realize is that he opened up the door for her because what she said was, okay, great, then I'll just do this. And she thrust herself fully uh, into the movement. Uh, and, and so what he saw as blocking her and ended up being, um, you know, opening up the door for her. In, in interesting but how, how rare, by the way, because how many mm -hmm. of us would be crushed saying, oh my God, it's, I can't do right. anything. I'm trapped. I'm lost. And it's, it is remarkable. I, I think the, the basic theme of, of her life is that nothing stopped her. The polio didn't stop mm -hmm. her. The extreme poverty didn't stop her. And then uh, these harrowing events that uh, th this uh, hysterectomy, if you could describe that, because this is also, this is, I would say, modern America. Uh, this is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, th this is our times, my lifetime. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and then this Winona incident, yes. which she also describes in this testimony. Yes. Uh, so in 1961, one year before Hamer joins uh, the civil rights movement, she is the victim of a forced sterilization. Uh, and, uh, you know, Hamer at the time, uh, in, in the years leading up to this, Hamer had been trying to have children and had not been successful. You know, she had experienced um, several miscarriages, you know, she and her, and her husband, Pap uh, or Perry, um, really wanted to, to start a family. And, and uh, it, it was so painful for them to, in 1961, go through this really traumatic experience where Hamer is hospitalized because she had a small uterine tumor. And this was a non-cancerous tumor. It was, you know, this was a procedure that should have been fairly simple. And Hamer goes in for the procedure. The white doctor who performed the procedure without Hamer's knowledge decided to remove Hamer's uh, uterus. And as I talk about in the book, that experience itself is already traumatic. You know, that's already traumatic. But to add insult to injury, he doesn't tell her. He doesn't, he says nothing to her. Oh my he God, meets, I didn't, re yeah. I, I, mi I missed that point. I missed yeah, that point. Yeah. He, he didn't tell her. Um, so she went back, you know, she's on the oh. plantation with oh. her loved ones. She finds out through gossip because he doesn't tell her, but he tells the wife of the landowner, um, who's a relative of his. So he tells other people. Oh my God. And people start talking about it. And so Hamer is completely stunned when she finds this out. And almost, I mean, it's unbelievable. So she, she actually rushes back to confront the doctor, to ask him like, what happened? You know, how could you do this to me? And the doctor refused to, to talk to her. He refused to answer her questions. One could imagine um, the pain, the anger that Hamer felt. And later on in reflecting on it, she said that she knew there was nothing she could do. Uh, she felt so helpless, you know, as a black woman in Mississippi, confronting this white doctor, she said she knew that you know, that she could not really take matters into her own hands. Uh, and all the anger that she felt, she needed to find a way to, to channel it uh, into, into some effort to bring about change. Uh, and she finds the answer. She finds the answer when she becomes a civil rights activist. She decides that she's going to talk about the forced sterilization. And so there are a lot of these moments where, where Hamer shows up. People think that she's coming to talk about 
voting rights. And she does talk about voting rights. She talks about the importance of the vote. And then she sort of shifts the narrative and she starts, she starts talking about violence. And then she starts talking about medical racism and medical violence and, and the violence that she endured at the hands of this white doctor. That surprises a lot of people. And she's talking about this at a moment where, quite frankly, a lot of people didn't want to talk about it. Uh, it was uncomfortable. And she insisted that she needed to tell the story because one, one of the things that people need to know is that what happened to Hamer was not unique to Hamer. In fact, it was a pattern. It was a troubling pattern whereby black and brown women, impoverished women would go into the hospital. This is true, not only for Mississippi, this was happening across the South. It was happening all over the country. I talk about in the book, you know, all these statistics of women who would go in for all kinds of procedures and doctors would take it upon themselves to decide who they considered fit or unfit to reproduce. And they would remove uterus. I mean, they would just remove someone's uterus. Um, and Hamer pointed it out. She spoke about it and she wanted people to know what was happening to um, black women, what was happening to, to poor women. And, and she demanded that, that, that these you know, practices stop. Uh, so that's one example of, of the violence that she endured in her lifetime. Uh, and then the second point, that's another pivotal moment for her is actually one year before she gives this testimony in Atlantic City. And that's 1963 um, in Winona, Mississippi. Hamer is traveling with a group of activists. They had just organized a voters um, registration workshop and they're traveling from South Carolina uh, back home. And they stop in Winona, it's a rest stop. You know, Some folks have to use the restroom, other people wanna grab a bite to eat. And yet it ends up being this particular moment where Hamer once again experiences uh, brutal violence. I mean, Hamer is sitting on the bus looking out and seeing her friends being arrested by police officers and not knowing what's going on. She gets off of the bus just to inquire and within minutes uh, a police officer starts kicking her and she's on the ground. Uh, she's arrested along with several activists and they're taken to a Winona prison cell and in that prison cell the beatings continue and in that prison cell not only do, do police officers beat her and other activists, but they force um, other prisoners to do the same. Uh, Hamer uh, leaves that prison cell with a number of ailments. Uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that she, you know, had polio as a young child, so she walked with a limp, and that beating ultimately worsened the limp. Uh, she had kidney damage, a uh, blood clot in her eye, uh, just a number of physical problems as well as as one can imagine, emotional and, and psychological trauma that she endured after that beating. Uh, one of the things that Hamer later reveals, she doesn't say it initially, but within you know a couple of years as she's comfortable, she begins to talk about the fact that there's also a sexual assault that takes place uh, in that prison cell. These are the things that she's talking about in August 1964 before a national audience um, as bold as ever, sitting there telling people, this is what I went through, this is what we went through, um, and this is what Black people are facing in this country. Why? Again, what is the crime that, that has been committed? Oh, the crime of trying to register people to vote. Rights that we're supposed to have as citizens of the United States. It's quite remarkable to hear him a story. And, and, and of course, unique how she told it how straightforward mm -hmm. as she always said telling it like it is uh, and she wasn't going to hold back and one can imagine I, mean, I can't imagine uh every one of those incidents she just carried on with even more fervor one of your great themes and it's a theme i think of all your uh, historiography and and uh, your view is she's speaking uh from multiple points of view of disadvantage uh, and uh, the obviously the the, the racial uh, I think uh, discrimination is uh, is um, such an understatement or euphemism for the extraordinarily violent white supremacism of the US at that time but also for, as a woman, uh, which is mm -hmm. not so usual, even in the civil rights movement, uh, which is one of your main points. And mm -hmm. a lot of the men, this was 
fairly patriarchal civil rights movement yeah. in a way, I think it's, it's fair to say, and from the class point of view, uh, that uh, who is this sharecropper? She doesn't even speak properly, and uh, mm -hmm. where's her PhD and so on? Yeah. And so she's representing this intersectional perspective of uh, from gender, class, and race in an extraordinary way. And decades before this was kind of sorted out uh, as an understanding of these multiple kinds of representations. But you've, you've uh, made a, a wonderful uh, body of knowledge about uh, African-American women leaders throughout uh, modern history that have uh, acted in this way. I, I wonder if you could just put her in that broader context of these remarkable women that you've been writing about. Yes, uh, and so as you were talking, I was thinking about many of the women who I wrote about in my first book, Set the World on Fire, and uh, similarly, these were women who I talk about as uh, women who were ultimately on the margins, and, and as, you, as you just, you know, perfectly explained, it's not just that they were Black women, it's not just that, you know, they were uh, having to deal with patriarchy, having to deal with sexism, I mean, all of that is true. But it's, but it's also that they were working class or, or, or to be more accurate, working poor Black women, uh, often in spaces where not only white people didn't necessarily want to hear them, but more to the point, other Black people didn't want to hear them either because they didn't fit the mold. Uh, they didn't fit the mold, uh, you know, of, of who certain, you know, many people thought a leader um, should be or what a leader should sound like, what a, a leader should look like. You know, we have to think about the longer history uh, and what um, we talk about, you know, as, as the politics of respectability, which is broadly this, this notion that Black people have to uh, come up with these strategies to send a message to the rest of the world that that they belong. And so, how do you how do you get other people to um, accept you as equal? Well, you you try to show them how similar you are to them. So maybe it's demonstrated by the way you speak or the way that you carry yourself, the way that you dress. Uh, and so, there's all this emphasis on, on 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 formal education and 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 you know presenting yourself a certain way these are very much wrapped up in middle class um, elite uh, you know visions the reality is that that's not that's not Hema's you know um, experience neither is it uh, the experience of, of any of the women who I talk about uh, in, in my earlier work and so what I have done in my scholarship is try to push these women to the center to really, I think, complicate our collective understanding um, of who we consider, on the one hand, who we consider an intellectual. I, I want us to, you know, and, and us broadly, you know, just everyone reading the book, to begin to understand that leadership doesn't just look one way, mm -hmm. to understand that sometimes the leader is, in fact, the sharecropper, the disabled Black woman with a sixth grade education. Um, and, 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 and to see that even though she did not have much access, she did not have much material resources, that she had a vision of the world. And more to the point, she had a, a commitment, a desire to bring about meaningful change, a love for people, all people. Um, and I think if we open up ourselves to listening to her, to, to hearing what she has to offer us, we could in fact be transformed the same way so many others were transformed when they encountered her. Uh, and so you're absolutely right to, to say that, you know, in telling the story about Samuel Hamer, it, it does fall within, you know, my, my broader scholarship to, to center Black women as activists, um, to see how they function as organizers, you know, as, as thinkers, um, even when we don't see them, they are doing the work. Uh, and that's the irony of, of this story is that you, 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 didn't, you know, you may not have seen Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, but she was there and she was inspiring people and she was making such a difference. Uh, and uh, it, it is truly, I think, a powerful story uh, and, and one that I'm glad I get to tell. 
one thing that I find amazing about history, it's uh, of course the theme that you uh, that you live, represent, uh, teach, is uh, the question who gets to tell the story. Uh, and in general, it's the victors that tell the story. It's the mm -hmm. powerful that tell the story. Uh, American history has been told by powerful white people uh, that have created uh, not just their own view, but what is history. Uh, and uh, so the voices that you're bringing back and featuring and uh, making people listen to who are absolutely core to our history are not known in general because the way that the story is told and especially by whom it's told is not exactly a, a, a balanced ob objective view of reality. It's told from a particular perspective. And I, I mentioned to you before, uh, just before we started that uh, COVID for me has been, uh, you know, aside from the lockdowns and all the rest, uh, a period of uh, reading and listening to uh, lots of audiobooks and, and uh, perhaps more time for thinking and reflection than we might otherwise have had. And the most amazing experience for me in this period was reading, actually, I listened to 40 hours of the audiobook of Black Reconstruction by uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, I wanted to ask you about it because you're the, the great expert on all of this history. But what amazed me, it's uh, it was 40 hours. I thought I was going to listen to 10 or 15 minutes. It's the story of how Jim Crow is reasserted and how apartheid America is constructed. Mm -hmm. So exactly what Fannie Lou Hamer is trying to end, Du Bois in the 1930s is describing how it is put back into place after a civil war that supposedly freed all Americans. Uh, and that had created the second republic that was a republic for everybody. But what so moved me, I thought I'd listen to a little bit. I was riveted for 40 straight hours uh, because it's a work of great genius in my view. Um, mm -hmm. But it was one brave scholar against a whole racist <laughs> academic establishment led mm -hmm by a professor at my university, at Columbia University, uh, Dunning, uh, who had the Dunning School of uh, History, who mm. told the story that, <clears throat> you know, everything that happened after the Civil War, when uh, there was Black empowerment, was awful, and thank God it was corrected uh, by, uh, by the, the, the whites taking over again. And one person made himself heard in the 1930s and history never could be the same again uh, even though they tried to push him away and eventually pushed him out of the country but he changed the way we know history one person incredibly brave absolutely um and you, as you were talking I, there's so many parallels that one can draw to Fannie Lou Hamer because, you know, I, I always marvel at the fact that today we can talk about Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, uh, generally speaking, in, in a very, um, you know, triumphant kind of way. People, people love it. And, uh, and yet, I, I, I think about going back to reading how people responded to exactly. the book, right? I mean, it's so interesting how much has changed. As you point out, people were, were very upset. Um, I mean, people critiqued the book, uh, certainly critiqued Du Bois, and it took a while, I think, for, um, for even historians to look at the text and, and begin to accept that, in fact, uh, Du Bois was doing something quite, quite extraordinary, which, you know, which was, not even a miracle, I mean, in the sense that he was, he was simply telling the truth of the history. He was simply centering Black people, um, showing the importance of Black agency. He was simply pushing back against, you know, these, these sort of representations of Reconstruction, uh, you know, as a failure. And, and he was using, uh, you know, his knowledge, you know, as, as a historian, I'll emphasize that, Exactly. Um, because a lot of people forget that Du Bois was a historian, which I always chuckle about too. Um, but he was using all of, you know, all of these skills 
uh, to, to, to present the history, the true history. And it took so long, I think, for people to, to actually uh, recognize the significance of, of this intervention. And imagine, imagine, so think about this. You're talking about a, a black man with a PhD from Harvard. I mean, we, du, du Bois, um, one of the most prolific um, black people in history, quite frankly, and I think you'd be hard pressed to find anyone who can even compare to someone like Du Bois. Uh, pure genius, amazing. Pure genius, right? And imagine that if he's facing those kinds of, I mean, that kind of resistance, now imagine Fannie Lou Hamer. Imagine <laughs> Fannie Lou Hamer with a sixth grade, right? I mean, imagine Fannie Lou Hamer showing up um, and, and actually having something to say and saying it to people who um, don't think that she has a right to be speaking, not only because she's a woman, because she's a, uh, she's a poor black woman, you know, and, and, and I just, I, I mean, I think how much the odds were against her in that sense, uh, and how much courage one needed to have pushed back. Uh, there's a, there's a scene in the book, and I, you probably chuckled when you read it too, um, as I always chuckle, uh, where Hamer is having this confrontation um, with Adam Clayton Powell and, uh, this is at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. I love that. <laughs> yes, I love this. I mean, it's just so amazing. And, uh, and he's talking to Hamer, you know, he's trying to reason with her, trying to get her to understand, like, you know, this is the- You got to compromise, be yeah, real. Yeah, compromise. You know, this is what we do. You know, we're experienced politicians. We know how this goes. And she's not accepting what he has to say. So he's, he's a bit puzzled, like, you know, maybe you don't know who I am. So he says, do you know who I am? And she says, yeah, I know who you are, but how many bales of cotton have you picked? How many beatings have you taken? Um, and I just thought to myself, wow. Yeah, exactly. So amazing. Um, you know, it's her way of saying, listen, you may very well have a title, right? I know who you are, but let me tell you, I am. I'm the black woman who endured all of these things. And I'm speaking on behalf of the people of Mississippi and as much as I know you have something to say and you think I have to listen to you, recognize that I bring something to the table. It's life experience, right? I don't have all of these degrees. I don't have much formal education, but I have life experience. And that compels me to be able to stand here and speak back to you. Uh, and, and I just, I think it's one of the most powerful moments that, cap that really just helps us see who Hamer was uh, as a person. And, that, and it helps us see why she was so effective because you know, people gravitated toward her because they saw, I think, in her just this authentic person um, who just, as you said, who told it like it was. I mean, that was one of her phrases to tell it like it is. She would tell you what's on her mind. You could trust her. Uh, she didn't give you fluff. She didn't just say stuff to make you feel good. And that meant that that you know, when she spoke, you would in fact listen. I mean, it, it is quite powerful. Um, and I think, you know, as I reflect on it, I think it's truly a model for us today. I could not agree more. And uh, it's it's such a, uh, a a great gift that you've given us to be able to read her words and uh, think about her, her life uh, again in our present context. And I should point out that the your book uh, moves back and forth between her words and absolutely the current crises that we're in, the current divisions that we're in, uh, and boy, we're in more trials of police brutality right now, more uh, murders of uh, young Blacks, uh, completely innocent kids being gunned down and then claim, no, no, it was an accident and, and so on. So uh, there's nothing more resonant and we're in a, a huge debate over history, of course. You know, you're at the center yes. of this swirling debate. And I, I wonder if you could uh, reflect for us a little bit about where we stand in this debate. I, I think we will, of course, what's wonderful is that uh, these stories and the history are being told. And frankly, that uh, Native Americans, African Americans, Asian Americans are telling the history themselves, not depending on someone else to tell the history, because we saw what happened when uh, 
white Americans told the history of black Americans, it did not exactly come out as a very accurate uh, rendering. But we're in this huge public debate right now. You must follow it hour to hour, day to day. Mm -hmm. where, where do we stand on it? Well, you know, um, I think a lot about uh, a piece of advice that one of my mentors gave me several years ago. I, I you know, I, I wrote an op-ed. It was probably one of the first op-eds that I wrote. Um, and remember just receiving a lot of, a lot of negative feedback, a lot of pushback, a lot of pushback. people were emailing <clears throat> me, calling me, um, not saying very nice things. And I called one of my mentors and I said, you know, this is, you know, this is frustrating. You know, what, what should I do? I, I, I'm just shocked that people are responding this way. And, and she said to me, if you are not facing resistance, um, in your work, then you're not doing anything worth resisting. <laughs> and, and I remember thinking like, okay, and so what she was saying to me is, listen, this is part of the process. You know you are on the right track when people are ready to stand up and block you. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's quite telling to me that we are at this moment, just at the very same moment that we're seeing, one might say the explosion of scholarship that is, you know, as you point out, centering the voices of marginalized people, narratives being written by folks like me. Um, and, and, and in fact, you know, books and articles that are being circulated widely, I, you know, I think I, I'm certainly grateful to have a readership and an audience that I think, you know, other folks like me didn't have 20 years ago, 10 years ago, you know, and at this very same moment, there is all this pushback now trying to uh, limit what information will show up in, in schools to see people resisting Toni Morrison's work and saying maybe we should not have her books um, in a classroom. Uh, you know, I, I just, on the one hand, I'm frustrated, but on the other hand, I think, okay, this is a sign that the work that we're doing is actually making an impact. Um, it's it's shifting people's you know perspectives. It's it's causing I suspect you know students to um, look within and to ask the kinds of questions you know to their parents that maybe they didn't ask. Uh, you know the parents might not have expected the students to ask. And uh, and a lot of people are terrified by this. A lot of people are terrified. Uh, we know that change is, is always difficult. Uh, and so I'm not um, as much as it is frustrating. I I, I think to myself, okay. I have, I certainly have to keep doing this work. We all have to keep, um, you know, doing this work uh, because it is important for us to know our full history, period. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer needed to know about the passage of the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment, right? She needed to know what had taken place in the 19th century. She needed to know these things uh, because they empowered her to be able to strategize in, the, in, in her lifetime. We need to know about Fannie Lou Hamer. We need to know about what she endured. We need to know about this history so that it empowers us to strategize in our lifetime. And hiding that history serves no one. Um, you know, hiding that history doesn't change it. Uh, and so I think- Exactly. That, you know, it doesn't, right. It just, it doesn't change and, and, it. So, and when, when yeah. Mitch McConnell, uh, who uh, is, I, I am not <laughs> much of a fan, writes to uh, the Secretary of Education and says, we shouldn't teach this stuff, it makes kids unpatriotic it divides our country it's really unbelievable uh, actually i mean it, it, it's it not unbelievable but it is it's awful uh, and that it is it. the perspective and yet the truth is there's of, of course there's horrible things that are uncovered in the truth because we have uh, a, a very uh, uh, part of the history that is absolutely shocking and evil on the other hand it uncovers glory uh, it uncovers bravery diversity fortitude yeah. uh, core values of human of humanity uh, in ways even greater than we could have imagined because you read these stories and they're uh, of Fannie Lou Hamer and they're exactly. profoundly inspiring uh, her life is even more inspiring than the darkness of uh, that yeah. that is that that made it possible because she's actually a symbol not not just a symbol she's iconic for us in how to persevere in countless contexts uh, and so there's something so glorious about this true mm -hmm. history 
that we should be uh, absolutely uh, regarding as the great gift now that so many voices are present giving us the true history. You're absolutely right. And I did not learn about Fannie Lou Hamer um, until I was a senior in college. And I was majoring in history and Africana studies. I mean, think about that. That's amazing, wow. by the way. Yeah. But by the way, I, I am 67 and I say to my wife almost every day, I cannot believe I never learned about such and such. It's constant wow. throughout life. Mm -hmm. and I, I didn't even know about, black, about Du Bois' Black Reconstruction actually wow. until a couple of years ago. Never mm -hmm. heard a word about it. So this is why it's so important what you're doing, so important uh, the uh, African-American Intellectual History Society, so important your voice uh, and uh, we have unfortunately run out of time because i have a thousand things more <laughs> i want to talk with you about and we will find more time to do that but in closing let me thank you for a, a wonderful book but a, a, a wonderful opening for us not just this book but all of your writing because you're bringing incredible perspectives and important voices to the fore that are profoundly enriching for us. So Keisha Blaine, uh, thank you again. And uh, everybody, please read this wonderful book, Until I Am Free, Fannie Lou Hamer's Enduring Message to America Truly is Enduring. Thank you so much, Keisha, for being with us. And let me uh, tell everybody listening that uh, our next uh, book club is uh, on uh, December 16 at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, 4 p.m. Uh, in uh, Europe. Uh, it is uh, Heather Cox Richardson, another wonderful historian mm -hmm. yes. uh, and author of How the South Won the Civil War, Oligarchy, Democracy, and the Continuing Fight for the Soul of America. We continue on the same themes with Heather Cox Richardson next month. Keisha Blaine, thank you very much and congratulations. Thank you so much and thanks to everyone for coming.